Since January, we've been studying the book of Titus here at the chapel. And this is a book that was written by the Apostle Paul to his disciple Titus. And it was designed, or the intention of the book was to help Titus establish godly, Christ-honoring churches on the island of Crete. Sometime between his third and fourth imprisonment, Paul had an opportunity with Titus to go to Crete, and they evidently planted some churches there, and they were not able to finish all of the theological training and the establishment of the churches that they wanted to do. And Paul somehow, we don't know uh, historically, but for some reason he had to leave the work and he sent Titus back at a later date. And so we looked at Titus chapter 1, which concerned the establishment of godly leadership in the local church. We looked at Titus chapter 2, which established the conduct of believers amongst one another within the local church. And we are today and next week, we'll be finishing Titus chapter 3, which looks at the conduct of believers amongst the unbelieving world. And so how do we, as those who have called upon the name of Jesus for salvation, how do we interact with the unbelieving world? And here's Paul's main point in chapter 3. Believers must conduct themselves in a Christ-honoring and Christ-exalting manner as they live lives to witness to the unbelieving world. You know it's cliche, but it's true. That's why it becomes a cliche. You might be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. And why, why does that become cliche? Why is that a truism? Because the testimony of your life might be the only representation of Christ that anybody has an opportunity to see. So my friends, is your life a Bible worth reading? Think about that. Is your life a Bible worth reading? If that was the testimony, and, and that is Paul's challenge to Titus. That is Paul's admonition to Titus. And by extension, it's the admonition to the local church. You, believers in Christ, you, those who claim Jesus Christ as Lord, are you living according to the standard that has been established for us? This brings us now to Titus chapter 3, verse 8. And Paul is wrapping up his instructions to Titus and to the church. Here's what the text says. Look with me. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. And these things are good and profitable for men. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factitious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and sinning, being self-condemned. Here in these four verses, we find two ways for believers to practice Christ-honoring conduct. There are two ways for believers to practice Christ-honoring conduct. First, it requires proper deeds. And second, it requires sound doctrine. Let's take a look at the first way that believers can witness to the unbelieving world. Believers must pursue proper deeds. And this... This is something, the proper deeds that we do, this is motivated by our common salvation. I want you to just pick up the context of verse 8 by going all the way back to verse 3. <clears throat> Notice what Paul writes beginning in verse 3. For we were once also foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved, 
to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Do you know what that is right there? That is a statement of the gospel. That is what we are to proclaim to the nations as we make disciples. We are to let all peoples know that at one point in time, we were all foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. We could do nothing that would satisfy God. Nothing that could become, that could make us righteous in his sight. Because our sin separated us from a holy creator. That's where all men start out life. But note the contrast in verse 5. He saved us, not because of the deeds that we did, but because of his great mercy. And so there's no way that any of your deeds that you ever do will be enough to pay the price for your sin. You have to have somebody else pay that price, and that someone was Jesus Christ. When he was crucified on the cross of Calvary, the blood that he shed satisfied God's wrath against all sin of all men for all time. It was a total and totally sufficient payment. And it's like a, a bank account where an infinite deposit was made. And those who are willing to place their faith in Christ can receive a free gift that is the salvation of their sins through their faith in Christ. We, who have called upon the name of Jesus, who have believed in the resurrection, who have placed our faith and trust in Him, that He is the only one who saved, and we are saved by our faith. We are the ones who then should be motivated by our common salvation to pursue proper deeds. We wouldn't expect people who are not like us to pursue these deeds, but we would expect ourselves, those who are of the community of faith, to pursue proper deeds. And what what are these deeds? What are they? These deeds, these deeds are deeds that those who have believed in Christ must engage in. These deeds are good deeds. As we've talked about several other times, good is a reference to a thing's moral quality. Remember, good is a reference of, to morality or to moral quality. So when you say, I'm good, that's not actually true because you're, you're, you're not morally perfect, okay? If you're feeling well and you're in a good mood, you can say, I'm well, I'm doing fine. But to say, I'm good, is not quite accurate according to the use of language. Good is a reference to moral quality. And so in this context, good deeds are those deeds that would be determined by God himself and would be in accordance with a standard established by God. In a very general sense, these deeds would be deeds that bless, uplift, and benefit others. Galatians 6.10, another epistle of Paul, he writes this, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Notice that these deeds that we are doing in verse 8 are the result of salvation, not a part of salvation. Okay? Understand the contrast. You have to look at verse uh, 5 to see the contrast here. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness. So he didn't save us because we did good deeds. 
But if we have been saved, the natural result of being saved by a great salvation is that we will engage in good deeds. Now, what types of deeds does God specify believers ought to do? Well, in James chapter 1, verse 27, James writes that believers should consider visiting widows and orphans in their distress. In James chapter 2, James talks about believers providing food and clothing for those who are in need. In 1 Timothy 5.10, Paul writes that widows who are going to be put on the list to be cared for by the church must have had a reputation for offering hospitality to strangers and assisting those in distress. Now, again, those are general terms. There are a lot of ways that you could assist somebody who is in distress. But it's clear from the New Testament that that is a type of deed that uh, reaches a moral standard that's established by God. Paul wants Timothy to speak confidently about these things. In contrast to those false teachers who were in the church, and we're going to talk about them in a moment, but he must speak confidently about them, encouraging the church to be careful to engage in these good deeds. That means that we as the church, we who have a common faith, must be intentional, intentional about carrying out these good deeds. We have to be ready to jump in at a moment's notice and practice a good deed. It requires an active searching, looking for opportunities to do good. And it also requires that we not pass up opportunities to do good if one should arise unexpectedly. And that's how things often happen, right? We often have an opportunity to engage in good deeds when somebody that we know is dealing with a crisis or circumstances that are beyond their control or something happens and you know they're all of a sudden in a bind and they call you and they say, I need help. Well, you know what? I didn't sit down with my day timer and plan out help so-and-so at 2 p.m. today. I didn't do that. But guess what? The opportunity arose, and if I'm going to engage in good deeds, maybe I should consider stopping what I'm doing right now and going to help the person who's in distress and perform a good deed for them. And it's not just so that I get some type of credit. That's not why we do it. We do it as a result of the salvation that we received from our great triune God. That's why we do the good deed. Because we are merely passing along the mercy, the grace, the blessing that we have received from God himself. Amen. Our good deeds are a demonstration to others of the change that has occurred in our lives. And Paul says that these good deeds are a measurable blessing to all men. Look at the last sentence of verse 8. These things are good and profitable for men. We pursue good deeds not only because we are motivated by our common salvation, but by, because we can be a measurable blessing to all men. How would I restate this? How would I restate Paul's sentence? I would say this. The influence of Christian conduct should be felt in the non-Christian community. That's what Paul is saying here. The influence of Christian conduct should be felt in the non-Christian community. The word men in the text is actually the Greek word anthropon. It's the general word in the Greek language that means mankind. So it refers to both men and women. So when uh, Paul says these things are good and profitable for men. He's not only talking about things that benefit the males of a society. He's talking about all of mankind. And to be honest, this is the type of language that God has used from the very beginning to describe all of humanity. We tend to make it gender neutral by saying humanity, but God in his word, God who is the creator, has made it gender specific, calling man all of humanity, mankind. That's what he chose to name all of us 
back in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And so we see in the Greek language the same thing. This word that stands for mankind is translated men. But it means to all members of the community, men, women, and children. And the result of these good deeds that believers do is those things that is good and profitable. That which is good and profitable. Paul says here that the good deeds are both of a certain quality and a certain quantity. You understand that? The good deeds are of a certain quality because they make a difference in somebody's life and they're of a certain quantity, which means that the unbelieving world can see the multitude of good deeds and be able to point and say, hey, those people who name Jesus are doing these deeds. So it's a high quality of deed and it's also a large quantity of deeds that are done. And if you examine history, Ask yourself this question. Which group of people were motivated to build hospitals and orphanages? Which group of people were motivated to establish schools to teach reading and writing? Which group of people were motivated to perform other acts of mercy that benefited all of society? Largely Christians. Christians are the ones who built schools and orphanages, and hospitals, all throughout the known world. Now, some who are cynical may doubt the motivations of believers throughout history, but I tell you the truth, there are still Christians today who are motivated by their salvation and their love for humankind because God said to love their fellow brother. And they continue today to do these same types of things, to build hospitals and orphanages and schools to teach reading and writing. One such example is a group called Samaritan's Purse. Some of you may know. I think uh, Franklin Graham is the president and CEO. Here's their mission statement. Samaritan's Purse provides spiritual and physical aid to hurting people around the world. Since 1970, Samaritan's Purse has helped meet needs of people who are victims of war, poverty, natural, natural disasters, disease, and famine with the purpose of sharing God's love through his son, Jesus Christ. And so there are Christians today who are concerned with doing good deeds that are good and profitable for all men. Let me ask you, Samaritan's Purse is an organization that typically works in some of the most dangerous parts of the world. But what are we doing in Fremont, Ohio, or Gibsonburg, or Northwood, or Lindsay? What are we doing in our local community to engage in good deeds that would bless the entire community? That's a good question. We should really consider that as a local church. I know something that some of you have done, which is to be involved in the Crisis Pregnancy Center, Heartbeat Hope Medical which is a facility that helps young women who have unplanned pregnancies think about those pregnancies in a biblical way. And that stands in stark contrast to the mission and goal of Planned Parenthood, which looks at unplanned pregnancies in a very satanic way, okay? a very non-biblical way. So that's one thing that I thought of in our own community that we could be engaged in that would be a witness to our own community. And perhaps you can think of more. Now we do these good deeds, again, because we are motivated by a common salvation. And this is really the positive portion of Paul's message to Titus to the church. Okay, you guys, you've received this common salvation. Now go out and do something good as a result of it. But we have another responsibility as believers. And that responsibility is that we must promote sound doctrine. So I phrase this in a positive way because I think we want to look at this positively. I could have said believers must reject false teachers, which is also true. 
But in the rejection of false teachers, we also want to promote sound teaching and sound doctrine. So it's like, yes, stay away from that which is false, and then do what? No, stay away from that which is false, but also promote sound, good, biblical, God-honoring teaching so that you know even more what the truth is. So believers have a responsibility to promote sound doctrine. And here in verses 9 through 11, uh, Paul writes to Titus and says that you promote sound doctrine by eliminating false teaching in your midst. False teaching and false teachers. Look at verse 9. There's a strong contrast here. But avoid... Foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Notice, we engage in good deeds. We actively pursue good deeds, but we avoid these foolish controversies. So we run to one thing and we run away from something else. Okay? That's the contrast that's present in the text. To avoid means that you're going to keep yourself from becoming involved or entangled in a certain activity. Now, we're all skilled at this when it comes to the workplace. If you see the boss coming around and you know that the company might be behind or maybe the boss has that look on his face and you're like, man, I can't make eye contact right now or I'm going to get assigned an additional task. So you just put your head down You pretend like you're working really hard, okay, and then he passes you by and you read that sigh of relief. Okay, you just avoided the boss, okay? You avoided the additional work responsibility. Well, that's how we're supposed to avoid these four things that Paul lists right here. We need to avoid fruitless discussions and arguments. These are things that have the appearance of wisdom but really aren't wise at all. They are actually time wasters. And I want to give you a reference to write down. I don't have time to exegete the entire passage, but I want to give you a reference for for comparison's sake. Colossians chapter 8, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 23. That is a parallel passage that provides greater context and explanation to discussions that have the quote-unquote appearance of wisdom. Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to turn there and just read a couple selections of that to you. Here's what Paul begins by saying. Colossians 2 verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Okay? And Paul then goes on to make an argument about why we don't want to be taken captive to empty philosophy and empty deception. Skip down to verse 20. The basis of Paul's argument is this. If you've died with Christ, then you've also died to the elementary principles of the world. Don't think like you used to think. Your thinking has been changed. Verse 20. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of this world, why as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with youth in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. Notice, Paul's talking about legalistic rules that have been given by some men for other men to observe. And Paul says, don't submit to those legalistic rules. Don't become a partaker in these types of discussions that advance legalism. These are matters, verse 23, which have the appearance of wisdom in what? Self-made religion. Christ-made religion? No, self-made religion. It's idolatry to become engaged in these types of discussions. And self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are truly of no value against fleshly indulgence. Paul dealt with um, individuals within the local church who wanted to create laws and rules and regulations that were 
unbiblical. He dealt with it all throughout his ministry. Here in Titus chapter 3, he gives Titus and the church there on the island of Crete four specific categories to avoid. Avoid foolish controversies, genealogy, strife, and disputes about the law. What are these things? What are these things? Well, foolish controversies are nonsensical and non-essential arguments that individuals engage in without any desire to actually resolve the issue. You understand? It's a nonsensical and a non-essential argument that individuals engage in without any desire to actually resolve the issue. You're arguing over issues without any intention of changing your mind. You're arguing for the sake of argument. And the issue that you're arguing over really has nothing to do with true doctrine. It's a periphery issue. It might not even be a biblically relatable issue. Paul could have mentioned a number of foolish controversies, but he didn't. He left a general heading there. Why? Because every generation and every culture has their own foolish controversies to avoid. We have our foolish controversies to avoid, and other cultures have theirs. For example, a number of years ago, there was a book written by a man named Rob Bell, and the book was entitled Love Wins. And in that book, Rob Bell makes this argument that did away with the doctrine of eternal condemnation. That you, know, you could go to hell, but then you would eventually get out. Or maybe you wouldn't stay there very long. You know what? I don't, I don't need to argue with Rob Bell about that. I don't need to spend time discussing that with him, unless he really wanted to engage in a biblical discussion. But mostly I just have to say, you know what? Jesus said that there is an eternal place of punishment, and he talked about hell far more than he talked about heaven. And so I don't, I don't need to spend time engaging in this controversy over how long are you going to be in hell? Is there really a hell? I don't need to engage in that, unless I'm just out and out rebuking somebody. But I'm not going to entertain that as a discussion point. Okay, we're not going to be like, oh yeah, let's sit down and discuss this to see if it's really true or not. No, we're just going to say, that's not a true doctrine, and you're wrong for believing that doctrine, and here's the scriptures. Done. Okay? So don't get engaged or drawn up into foolish controversies. Genealogies is the next category that Paul mentions. And this was something that was probably more particular to the Jews, but you know, the principle applies. Genealogies refers to listing of your descendants or your ascendants. So like, who was your father? And who was his father? And who are the people that you are related to? And the Jews argued over and discussed genealogies because they wanted to prove their social status and worth. That's what, it was all about like, oh, if I have the most pure genealogy, then I'm up here at the top of the social rung. And you might be a little bit lower. But because I'm at the top of the social rung, then that confers to me some type of special status. If you spend time arguing over genealogies and talking about these things, what's that going to do in the local church? It's going to create division. It's going to create jealousy. It's going to create pride in the individuals who find themselves at the top. And it's going to create arrogance in those same people but it's also going to create resentment in those people who may find themselves at the bottom. What's the reality for those who are in Christ? There's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, for we are all sons of God through Christ Jesus. That's Paul's argument in Galatians chapter 4. There's, there's no social or ethnic distinction any longer because we are equal in Christ. We are equal in Christ. So let's not worry about genealogies. Put those things out. Strife. Strife is conflict that results from rivalry and discord. Strife is something that's hard to see, kind of like, but when you're in it, you know that it's there. All right, sometimes it's hard to see strife, but when you're in it, you know that it's there. I think that this is a focus, uh, when Paul mentions strife, I think he's focusing on rivalries that church members might have with one another. 
So arguments that church members have one another about how to do a certain ministry. We've never had that happen at the chapel. I can confidently say we've never argued about how to do a certain ministry. No, that's not true. We have. We've experienced strife. Um, arguing who gets to do a certain ministry as if somehow there's some special status or award for being the one who does a ministry rather than allowing that particular work of service to bless the body of Christ. We need to avoid strife. That again means that we need to reject our personal pride and rebuke our own personal pride. Strife is a result of our pride, and we need to humbly repent of that. Finally, Paul says disputes about the law. The law here is a reference to the Mosaic Law Code, and more specifically to the rabbinical interpretations of the law. This would be aimed specifically at the Jews who were converted from Judaism who were in the congregation of the believers. The Jews had a really difficult time setting aside the Mosaic Law Code and learning that, you know, there's a new way of doing things now. It doesn't mean that the law was evil, but as Paul writes again in Galatians, the law was a tutor or a schoolmaster that pointed out your need for a savior. The law was designed to condemn you of sin, to convict you of sin, to show you how greatly you've sinned and how far the gulf is between you and God. In Christ, Christ fulfilled the law and built a bridge between you, the sinner, and God, who was afar off, but now is near through Christ. So you need to avoid disputes about the law. What does Paul say about these things? They are unprofitable and worthless. Note again this contrast throughout the text. Verse 5. Deeds that you did in righteousness, which didn't actually produce righteousness. Deeds that you do as a result of righteousness, in verse 8. And here, deeds that you partake in that are unprofitable and worthless. We need to stop engaging in these fruitless discussions. It results in stagnant spiritual growth and division within the local church if we continue to have these types of discussions. So we need to focus on true doctrine, not on the minutia, not on things that are not spoken directly about in the scriptures. Now, finally, the second way that we promote sound doctrine is that we reject men or women who teach false doctrines. The word reject means that you purposefully avoid association with somebody. You are going to shun this person. You are going to have nothing to do with this person. Now, this is a strong command from Paul to the church. This is not something that we are eager to do in our soft, weak-willed culture of inclusivity. We want everybody to feel welcome. We want everybody to feel included. Paul says, not everyone is welcome. Not everyone should be included. There are some who need to be rejected, some who need to be shunned, some who need to be put out of the assembly because they are damaging the entire assembly. They are devastating and they will shipwreck the church. This is a serious responsibility for believers to participate in. What type of person then should receive this rejection? What type of person should receive this shunning? Note verse 10 says, a factious man, a factious man. The Greek word, you'll know exactly what this person is once I pronounce the Greek word, or I'm going to attempt to pronounce the Greek word. Heretikon. Heretikon. Well, that has been uh, taken right from Greek into English as what? Heretic. That's the factious man. That's the Greek word used here for factious man. And the Lexham Research Dictionary says this, a heretic is one who is characterized by being schismatic, informing dissenting parties and groups. 
Somebody who wants to be schismatic is one who purposefully divides people up. And they use doctrine or false doctrine to do it. They purposefully divide people up. They are devastating to the church. Now, if you've been studying the church history class with Pastor John and Pastor Ron, you'll know that the church has a long and sordid history of dealing with heretics. The church has done everything to heretics, from excommunication to burning them at the stake. Now, what does Paul say you should do to a heretic? Reject that person. Paul says you reject the person. The seriousness of the sin of heresy is not minimized in any way, shape, or form by Paul. But Paul doesn't command the church to beat, imprison, or burn heretics. That is what men in their lustful, sinful flesh, have decided to do to try to reject this individual. That's wrong. Unfortunately, there have been both godly and ungodly people who have been uh, lighting the fires uh, upon heretics. We need to think about this very carefully. We reject Heretics, we do not associate with them. We avoid them. We shun them because if we don't, they will get in to the church. And as Jesus said about the, uh, the Pharisees, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. One or two heretics in a local church could spread the heresy throughout the entire church and the result could be catastrophic for that church. Well, what does rejection look like if we're not to burn this person at the stake? Okay, well, there's a long ways between rejection, like shunning, and burning somebody at the stake. I believe Paul is referencing the process of legitimate church discipline. Look, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. That implies that you have made an effort to appeal to him to repent of his false teaching. Isn't that what Jesus said to do in Matthew chapter 18? If your brother sins, go and confront him in private. And if he doesn't listen to you, take one or two witnesses and go and confront him again. That's two warnings. Now the third warning is if he refuses to listen to them, then you tell it to the entire church. And I believe that's where Paul's at right here. He's right at that third step of church discipline, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. This was to be a public rebuke in front of the entire church about this individual and their teaching. And what was the church to do? The church was to confront that man as a whole. Stop teaching this way. And if the man or woman refused to repent from their false teaching, then they were to be put out of the church Believers would not associate with them. And the purpose of that, again, is to bring pressure on them to repent, or if they don't repent, to prove ultimately that they were never truly a believer to begin with. Now you'll notice in the overhead that I have reject men or women who teach false doctrines. Um, Your sermon outline might just say men. But upon further study and upon further reflection, the Greek word that is once again used in this phrase is anthropon. It it is the word for mankind, right? And it could mean men or women. And I think it would be appropriate to think about rejecting a factitious man or a factitious woman from the church. Reject them. It's not just men who introduce false doctrines, but there are women who do as well. And so it would be appropriate to think about it in both contexts. Now, we don't really like the idea of rejecting somebody, but Paul provides reassurance in verse 11. He says this, Knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. We are to have confidence, that word know, knowing. You can know for certain something is true. If we know for certain that this person has continued their false teaching after a first and second warning, then 
we have confidence that we are doing the right thing when we reject them. It can cause distress when we have to reject somebody because we do have personal relationships with them. We want to extend grace and mercy. But we can't extend grace and mercy if people stubbornly refuse to repent of their false teaching or their sin. We can't do it. And so Paul says, don't worry, church. It's not you. It's not just you who are the ones who are making this decision. But the individual himself is what? Self-condemned. See, it says right there at the end of verse 11. They themselves have put themselves in this situation through their own refusal to repent. We can know that the heretic is perverted in his doctrine and in his teaching. We know that because he is teaching false doctrine, he is sinning. And he's also sinning because he has not listened to the rebuke of his brothers in Christ. And we know that the heretic is self-condemned because he refuses to repent, because he continues his perversion, because he continues sinning. We're not the ones passing judgment. God is. And we're just telling him what the judgment is. The judgment is, get out. You can't be here anymore. We won't tolerate that. Now, this is a grave responsibility, one that we should not undergo lightly. But it is an important responsibility because as believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility to promote sound doctrine. It is a serious task that we have been entrusted with. And it is part of fulfilling the great commission that Jesus left to his disciples prior to ascension into heaven. Why should we care about pursuing proper deeds and sound doctrine? Why? Because we need to live lives that honor Christ both in the local church and outside of the local church. Our goal is to bring glory to God first and foremost in everything that we do. Let's pray.